Welcome, bienvenidos y bienvenidas, bienvenue. Este evento cuenta con interpretación en directo en español. Para elegir un canal de audio, haga clic en este botón y seleccione su idioma preferido. Cet événement dispose de une interprétation en direct en français. Pour choisir un canal audio, cliquez sur ce bouton et sélectionnez la langue de votre choix. This event has live interpretation in English. To choose an audio channel, click on this button and select your preferred language. Interpretation is not available if you are connecting using the Zoom web client and on some mobile phones. Please, when possible, use the desktop app. Here are a few important tips for this call. Since we are many people on this call, microphones will not be active. Nonetheless, for us it is vital to hear from you. To do so, we will use Slido to ask you questions or opinions throughout the virtual forum. Also, during question and answer segments, your questions will be collected via Slido. To access Slido, go to slido.com, preferably on your mobile phone, and enter in lowercase letters the event code CSSI2021. Go in now and ask your questions at any time during the session. Don't worry, we will share the information on how to access Slido again through the chat. You can also access the chat to talk with fellow attendees or request technical support. However, keep in mind that we will only take questions you share via Slido. Now, there are other ways to get yourself heard too. Until Friday, March 26, we will be conducting a collaborative diagnosis on systemic risk for the education sector in the Caribbean. To take part, you only have to access the online board where you can share your views of what makes up systemic risk in the education sector, what puts pressure on the system, where it tips over and what you suggest we must do about it. The board is available in English, French and Spanish through the links now being shared via the chat. Finally, we point out that all sessions will be recorded. Thank you for being here today and we hope you enjoy. Welcome and good afternoon, practitioners, our teachers, our principals, officials from the Ministry of Education and other actors across the education sector. I am Dr. Laura Bristol and I'm Program Manager for Human Resource Development at the CARICOM Secretariat and I will also have the honor of serving as your facilitator this afternoon. The COVID-19 pandemic generated an acute crisis in education systems worldwide, leading to prolonged school closures to prevent the spread of the virus regionally and internationally. Regionally, the ministries of education have implemented emergency remote and distant learning procedures in order to try and ensure the continuity of learning and the mitigation of learning gaps. But dealing with the aftermaths of climate disasters is not new for Caribbean education systems. But now we are required to ensure sufficient preparation for any possible future hazards, particularly where we may now have to deal with double emergencies, a public health crisis and an environmental crisis. Our mitigation responses, therefore, must also consider the impact at all levels of the education system the basic education system, skills for lifelong learning, and the tertiary education levels. The session this afternoon provides an opportunity to reiterate then the value of education in building resilient societies, and it highlights the need for multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder, and regional coordination. Our session will feature four interviews, capturing the experiences from the Cayman Islands, St. Lucia, Guyana, and the Bahamas. And our Participants, our interviewees, and our interviewers will share with us some of the good practices that they implemented during the last year in response to the education disruption, especially where those responses were targeting vulnerable groups. They will also share with us how they use technology to support their responses and the lessons learned from other emergencies to frame strategies for any new challenges. As we engage with them, 
Questions and answers will be received using the Slido portal as presented in the introductory video using the code all in common letters CSSI 2021. Participants can actually start sending their questions at any moment during the session. We invite participants to also take part in the collaborative diagnostic diagnosis of systemic risks for the education sector, while they still have a chance to do so. Your inputs are important to collectively build a better understanding of the interconnectedness of risk seen through the lens of the education se sector. To participate, please click on the link in the chat. Each interview will run for approximately 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a round of questions from the audience for 10 minutes. When you hear the ping of a bell, it means that it's time to wrap up your last thoughts. So we go right in to round one of our session. We now turn to the first round, which highlights special education in the Cayman Islands. And our interviewer is Ms. Lilak Gronfil Yona, who is the head of the education sector at ISRA Aid Organization and is currently involved in education programs and humanitarian emergencies in countries in Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Our practitioner is Ms. Janice Headley, who has been working with the youth of the Cayman Islands for over 20 years. Ms. Headley has been working in the field of special education, specifically at the Lighthouse School for over 10 years. She has served as a classroom teacher, special education needs coordinator, deputy principal, and is now the acting principal. So Lila, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bristol. Um, good afternoon. Ms. Headley, um, we would like to ask you if you could briefly describe your school's mission and the profile of the students who attend there, please. Well, good afternoon to everyone um, from the Cayman Islands. Um, just to talk about um, the Light of School and its mission. Its mission is really to help our students with challenging needs to develop their um, unique abilities to their fullest potential. And we do that through innovative and individualized programs. And of course, including parents and partner, partnership with the community. Um, at Lighthouse School, we have a total of 120 students um, ranging from um, age five to 17. And we have students with moderate disability and learning disability to more severe profound. We also cater to students um, on the autism spectrum disorder, and that's a growing population right now at our school. In what ways did the unique needs of your students influence the response to the pandemic crisis? Well, that's a question. When I hear that question, I'm really smiling because when it was time for us to close school, as you probably know, Cayman went to, into lockdown quite soon. And right now we, are, um, we do, really do not have a community spread. So our students are back to school as of August of this year, um, last year. So for our school with our special needs, um, students with special needs, we really had to think long and hard about how we're going to approach um, distance learning. The first thing we did was to ensure that we communicate with our students, because many of them, they need support in with comprehension and routines. So we took the time out to ensure that we came up with strategies as to how to communicate to our students why they're at, at home and the fact that they need to remain at home. Some of the things that we do, we did um, social stories, wrote social stories. It's basically little stories that parents will read to their um, children in order for them to understand the reason why they have to stay at home. We did videos, we had individual meetings with um, our parents as well, of, as, as well with our, as well with our um, students. Another thing that we did is to ensure that our parents are ready and supporting um, the parents for them to be ready um, to support their own children. Because as you know, special needs can be technical and to, to a parent who might not have that skills, that specialized skills to um, support their students or their children, many of them were fearful, how am I going to do that? So we had to ensure that we support our parents. The other thing we did was to ensure that specialized equipment were sent home. 
equipment for communication, wheelchair, walkers, um, sensory related tools and teach boxes were sent home in preparation for teaching and learning. One big thing that we did as a school, as you know, in the same population, we talk and work a lot with um, SALT, that speech and language therapists. We work a lot with our occupational therapists, as well as our vision and hearing teachers and other support services. So at Lighthouse School, we did a multidisciplinary approach to teaching and learning, meaning that our teachers and all our support services working with the individual student would have met and collaborated um, to ensure that an integrated approach um, was um, done in terms of teaching and learning. And we thought that was really successful, um, you know, rather than teaching the child um, in isolation individually. Another thing that we did in Cayman at Special Needs School, Lighthouse School, was teletherapy. That was really something that we really focused on with our students with more profound need, with our therapists working one-to-one -one with our severe students and parents, so that the parents will gain the skills they need to work with students at home. Um, we very well knew that our students' uh, profound needs would be, uh, it would, would be a little bit difficult for them to learn. So we ensure that we, you know, did another approach for them. And that was through teletherapy. As you know, um, for our parents, I mean, understanding how their children learn, we had to support them. So we, of course, did a lot of parent series where we spoke about um, managing behaviors, um, zones of regulations, sensory integrations. So a lot of work done with parents. And I can tell you without the parents, it would be really, really difficult for us to reach our students. And um, in the end, we did reach a lot of our students. So those are some of the things that we did um, as a special needs school that I think is far different from the mainstream schools. Thank you. These are really inspiring um, best practices that you have shared. Um, when you look back at how you responded to the pandemic and knowing what you know today, uh, what would you have done differently? Or you, is there anything that you would have done differently? Um, differently, um, during the pandemic, we had to think a lot on our feet. So I would say now that we have a template for um, distance learning, I would really um, ensure that the parents have that training in terms of platform. So we have a template, we have um, policies um, being in place now and still developing just to ensure that our parents are understanding platforms. What we are doing as a school, we are continuing to use those, the platforms, Seesaw, Zoom, Teams at school here, so that our students are familiar so in case we have another um, pandemic or um, natural disaster and the students um, need to stay home, they will at least know how to um, navigate um, the, the platforms. Um, are there any other lessons you would like to share? Yes, um, closing the digital divide. Um, at my school, Really, we had less than 25 students without um, access um, to device and maybe less than five re access to internet. But it's still important to ensure that that divide um, between students and homes with access and without access is very important at this point if we are to move and continue into thinking about distance learning. So the digital divide is very important. Another thing I might say to um, staff, students, and family health and well-being, it's very important. So those that's some of the things that we did in Cayman. We ensure that um, Maslow hierarchy first, then Bloom's um, taxonomy. So the focus on ensuring that um, you know health was okay, free school meals um, was still um, happening. Um, students who were at school getting support um, with free school meals, still got support um, with the support of the ministry. 
and our department as well as a private sector. So that's a very um, good highlight for um, our country, the Cayman Islands, and something that I think all countries should think about. Thank you very much. I think we will now open the floor for um, Q&A with Dr. Lorette um, Bristol. Thank you, Lalette. Thank you, Janice, so much. It was really interesting hearing um, about the strategies that you've deployed for communication. You customized your packaging, the kinds of support that you've provided for your parents around capacity building, and in particular, those specialized equipment that we always need to support our learners. So I'm not seeing any questions popping up yet in Slido. So um, here, okay, here we go. So it's coming up. So what was the greatest challenge that you confronted in your school? Um, thinking as leaders, thinking on our feet, because of course we know that um, there wasn't for many countries, um, we didn't have a distance learning policy. So it's continue, um, continued evaluation and thinking and thinking ahead of what's um, gonna happen tomorrow. So that was a challenge. And I mentioned the bit of challenge which was quickly resolved um, by ministry with the private sector support to um, with um, access to computer or device as well as um, internet. Another big challenge I saw is really with our teachers. Teachers, they have families too. And you know they ended up had to be teaching at home, also um, caring for their children, their family and make, making sure that their children are online and learning as well. So health and well-being is really big for our school and our country in terms of um, how we ensure that we are considering the health and well-being of our teachers and for all. Um, but one thing that I need to say, um, many countries might be still in deep in the pandemic and um, with community spread, but in the Cayman Islands, we're back at school um, and we're functioning as usual as we would before the pandemic. A recovery, a recovery plan is very important. So um, we had our recovery plan. We knew exactly what we were going to do when we returned to school. Remembering that our children, they had losses, losses in terms of friendship, in terms of learning, routine and structure and students with special needs, they need that structure. So we had to plan. We did a lot of training with our teachers in terms of identifying trauma, in terms of um, ensuring that we foster and in ensuring that we allow our children to feel safe again. Lots of training. We even did training on, on preventative measures because our teachers had to go in the classroom with our students to say, okay, we exercise or we practice these hygiene protocols. So this is how we do it and so on. So we did a lot of preparation. We call it the respond to recovery plan at school. And that was really critical for a school as a special needs school where many of our students are not understanding. So just as we did when students were leaving, we also made videos and social stories and send them to, to parents so that they can prepare the children at least two weeks before they return to school. And then before they return to school, we also had class meetings. While the teachers were here preparing, students were at home and we had family meetings just for the students themselves to hear from um, their teachers in terms of what to expect when they come to school. So recovery plan is really essential um, for that continuity. And as a special needs school, we took um, the first six weeks to really focus on fun activities, getting our students to um, feel safe again um, back in that school environment that they're used to. Thank you for that, Ms. Headley. While you're on the question of um, the, this, the shared stories. Uh, there is a question here that's connected to that, those social stories and yeah. whether or not there were any specific strategies that worked well for your students on the autism spectrum. Um, the social stories definitely and videos and using their, um, at Lighthouse School, we use the app um, Pro Loco to Go where our ASD students can touch a picture or an icon and the, the, the iPad would actually speak. 
So if it's, I want to go bathroom, they can type in, I want, I go bathroom and touch a button and we can hear the audio. So um, it definitely works, social stories, communication um, in terms of their pool of school devices, as well as um, the social stories and videos, sorry, videos were one. What we did, we came in during the break before kids came back and we made several um, videos. Videos as to how to operate on the playground. We would have split our playground into three to four um, parts. So the kids remain in bubble. They stayed from the enter class until the end of the day, they stay with their class groups. And at Lighthouse School, the maximum number of students in one class is 10. And for the ASD classes, it's seven. So it's just all about training and routine and practice and reinforcing. So the parents had two whole weeks to read those stories, watch the videos before the students come and then we met with them. Um, it worked because ASD students are all about, uh, many of them about routines and schedule. So you'd have to you know, train the students how to go about doing that and to ensure that they follow the schedule. One slip of the schedule, it would be our faults as adults. Thanks for that. The next question that's coming through is what underlining, underlying issues were uncovered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? You've actually spoken to quite a few of the challenges that you've encountered, uh, but what did COVID expose that you probably were not anticipating uh, as a potential challenge or concern for you in this landscape? For us, um, it's always parent in, the importance of parental involvement. Because to be honest, without our parents, luckily when we had lockdown, our parents were locked down. Many of them were there at home. So getting our parents involved, training our parents, ensuring that um, the parents are sitting, for many of them, the parents had to be. But just creating that relationship with our parents and communicate with communicating with them. So one, we can have students engagement and participation, which really speaks to accounting for our students. So a lot of things that we had to do, um, one of them um, was to ensure that our students are engaged. It means that daily our teachers would have to check on engagement. Did this child come online? Did this child complete? And then at the end of the week report, and we would, um, we did our attendance policy. If a child was out for two sessions or two or three sessions, it's our responsibility to check up. So we had that really tight, very close um, monitoring um, while the students were doing distance learning. So um, that's one very important thing, keep our parents close to us, build that relationship, partner with parents, and we'll get the result in terms of engagement. The other thing um, is to keep the platforms going. In your school, when you return, ensure that you're using it in class for homework. It can be used for um, a child is out sick for an extended period on medical leave from school. Um, we engage the students through those uh, platforms. So that's something that we have been doing even before the pandemic at our school. We can use it for peer learning, um, a class across the, the hall um, you're on Zoom with that same class. Teachers can use for coaching. So just keep the platform going so that, again, easy, smooth transition when it's time for another distance learning sort of um, situation. And um, ensure that we have our guidelines and policies in place and ensure that we are updating them just in case. So that's very important. Now that all of us we've been through, we have a template, we can make that template better. So we can ensure that we improve on our policies and our guidelines, as well as the digital divide. That's a difficult one. Cayman is a very small country. Um, so we're able to close. And I can tell you, um, we're still working on ensuring that all our students, they have access to laptop. But um, in some countries, it might be difficult because it's a bigger um, country. Um, but get private sectors involved or private sectors were willing and able to just share and, um, you know, allow students to have um, their laptops or tablets. My school got done uh, contribution from partnership with um, private sector. 
Thank you for that. Um, and it's important to, to land where you, you refer to. At the end of this, we've all developed new policies where none existed before. Or we've revised policies where we previously had that needed critical updating. So we are now aware of the importance of planning for uh, crisis. And it's important to help us to do that so that we can mitigate some of the risks that we can find. So thank you very much, uh, Janice. Thank you very much, Lilac. Um, we really appreciate your sharing your experiences with us. And I know that we have gotten a lot to take take away. Uh, we want to move quickly on now then to our second round of interviews. And my apologies for not uh, referring to St. Martin in the introduction when I spoke to all the different member states who are involved in sharing. In our second round, we're gonna focus on highlighting on advancing psychosocial support in two cases in St. Lucia and St. Martin. Our interviewer is Dr. Alison Flax Archer, who has taught at secondary and tertiary levels of education for more than 10 and 20 years respectively. Presently, she's the Secretary General of the BVI National Commission for UNESCO, where she's able to give back to the Virgin Islands through the UNESCO Platform of Education, Science, Culture, Information and Technology. Our two practitioners are Mrs. Valerie St. Hilaire Henry. She has been an educator for 33 years. She's currently the principal for an all girls Catholic school, the Ave Maria Girls Primary School, which is located in the middle of the capital city of St. Lucia. And Mrs. Alga, Musington Service. She's the manager of Student Support Services Division of the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth and Sport. Olga is a therapist, trainer, youth worker, certified emotional intelligence practitioner, and a certified mindfulness life coach. She's a school safety focal point for St. Martin. So over to you, Alison, Valerie, and Olga. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bristol. Uh, ladies, good afternoon, listening audience and ladies in particular that I'm about to interview. Uh, these two ladies, Mrs. Newsington Service and Mrs. Henry have a wealth of uh, experience that they bring. So I'm going to ask them questions Actually, I'm going to ask the questions at the same time so that we can have a nice dialogue going. So Mrs. Henry, I'll start with you. Given the widespread impact of this, the COVID-19 pandemic on teaching and learning in St. Lucia, what were some of the psychosocial concerns or issues emerging at the general school level as a result of the pandemic? Mrs. Henry, are you there? I am there, sorry. I had to turn off my video so you can get me a better sound from me. Perfect. So my apologies. Well, at, in looking at this the concerns, there are many concerns there. In terms of the students, the, the, some of the psychosocial concerns and issues that emerged is, uh, sorry, um, the likelihood of the increase in the level of, of ch child abuse, neglect, exploitation of, 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 the ch of children, uh, to another extent, an increased level of depression and anxiety as a result of students being away from school and being at home, which, which brought out um, a, a level of separation anxiety because of not being in the school with their teachers. Another con very much um, concern on our list is cyberbullying. As students were online, the, the likelihood of predators and, and persons trying to get to, to them in a, in a negative way. And as a result of the lack of face-to-face -face interactions with students, you find that teachers would have um, not be able to identify students who need support on a timely basis because you know they're at home, you see them through a screen, which is different to them being in a classroom where you know you can pick up on on little um, little mood changes, little behaviors that you know can link to a a, a, a problem that need, the child may need a support. And uh, the first speaker spoke about special needs. We need to zero in on the special needs students as well because of the 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 way in which they 
interact, they need the one on one interaction. And as a result of, of not having the teacher close by, which, which involves the more or less hands on approach. So these are little concerns with the students who are accustomed of having the teacher there to give them the support, a pat on the back, a little encouragement, a little hug. So these were some of the concerns as we went into um, the online instruction. As a result of um, in St. Lucia, there was one time, one period of time we were face to face. And then we went into online instruction. It caused this unstableness in the environment. And as a result, especially at the secondary school level, there were some level of dropouts. Um, some students feeling left lost in the, in the virtual, virtual world. Um, and there was this level of this jointness, which further stre caused stress and grief to, 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 the, to families and to students. Um, in terms of parents, you know, especially students who are in exam classes, for example, CXC and those who write the national exam, there was this excess pressure placed on them by the parents because the parents feel that they are missing out or they're not getting enough instructions. And so there was this, um, there's the, there's this added pressure on them. Now the teachers on the other hand, they too had um, the concerns with teachers was coping with juggling. And I heard the, the first speaker mention that juggling with home, school, dealing with their own children, being able to juggle the home, the difference between you at home and you have to take care of your kids, you have to cook, you have to do this. And then you now have to settle into this online instruction where you have to, you have, you have a structured timetable and you have to meet your students. So these were some concerns. In addition to that, you did have teachers who, who went into thorough planning. And in some instance, when they went into some of the platforms, some students were not were missing. Some were, some were not there at all. So that added a more anxiety on, to the, on the level of the, the, the teachers because they, they, they are thinking of the syllabus and they want to complete the syllabus and the students are not there, they're not reaching them. So they too had that level of anxiety and even frustration. And the, the other point I need to bring across was the dual role. And that was one of the major stresses and concerns in, in relation to teachers where they had to play that dual role of learning to use the technology and at the same time teaching. So they had to be learning to use, um, for example, the Google Classroom so, and, and, and at the same time they have to teach. So they're doing the job on the job training, which was which brought a, a certain level of, of <coughs> frustration on, on, on their part. So basically, these are some of the concerns that emerged as a result of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Henry. Uh, I'm going to ask Mrs. Mussington Service a question before I come back to you. Mrs. Mussington Service, to what extent was the psychosocial, mental, and socioeconomic well-being of key beneficiaries, meaning the, the students and teachers factored into the response and decision-making? Yes, in, in St. Martin, the education continuity plan amidst COVID-19, the guidelines provided address psychosocial well-being. The psychosocial, mental, and socioeconomic well-being were also taken into consideration in all important decisions such as which student groups would return to school first, who are the vulnerable students, and what can we offer them, how we can keep in contact with our students, and also how we can adjust our promotion criteria. We conducted surveys of students, parents, and teachers throughout the year, which also had questions about their psychological and mental well-being, their employment status, whether they need food, their views on reopening school, etc. This information was used to also assist in decision making. In the area of response, some schools conducted daily social emotional classes where teachers tap into the feelings of their students and held healthy conversations with them. When students returned to the school buildings, these classes continued. 
Some schools also organize mindfulness, stress management, and self-care sessions for their school staff. And I was happy to see that many schools tweaked the Return to Happiness program for their students at the start of the new academic year. And then we also saw that some schools had where their teachers submitted weekly reflections on how they were dealing with online learning, including sharing information on how they were coping and what self-care strategies they were using and what they found helpful in that they can also assist other teachers as well. It was interesting to see at one school where they provided, it was two schools, I think, where they provided bush tea every morning for the, for the teachers and for the staff. And I saw a school also implementing a fitness program to assist teachers in not only staying fit and healthy, but also helping them to release some stress and anxiety. The teachers and staff also have access to counseling service so they can be referred to see a psychologist should they so desire. The Student Support Services Division and the Psychosocial Subcommittee, which comprises of counselors and psychologists working in our schools, they continue to monitor the well being of students, parents, and teachers throughout the entire pandemic. Different avenues were explored to ensure that counseling could continue using HIPAA compliant platforms for teletherapy. And care providers of schools were grouped into two support WhatsApp groups because it's important that the carers also receive support. It is so often that, that persons in care positions often are so focused on those within their care that they forget to take care of themselves. And we wanted to ensure that persons who are working in care also have had a necessary support. And so there were a lot of things that were done by the schools to ensure that in, in their response and in their decision making, that they not lose sight of the well being and the socioeconomic um, situation that their um, teachers and their um, students and parents were, were undergoing. I can feel your passion as you as you as you as you answer that question, uh, Mrs. Service. Thank you very much. I believe with given time, we only have uh, one more question for each of you. Uh, so, Mrs. Henry, a, a similar question: at the ministry and school levels, what to what extent was the the psychosocial well-being of key beneficiaries being? the students and the teachers again, factored into the COVID-19 response or decision-making. So that's a similar question for Mrs. Henry. Yes, okay. Um, as a, a stakeholder in the planning of the, the school continuity plan with the Ministry of Education, one of the, one of the things that we encompass in the, con, the, continue, the school continuity plan was the return to happiness program that my um, colleague just mentioned. This was, this had to be part of the, the plan where when the students returned to school, especially in September and sometime this earlier this year, the, the return to happiness program had to be done for the first two weeks in, instead of going into the, submerging into teaching and academics and so on. They had to spend two weeks of, of, of this program, which which dealt with getting them to be calm, um, allaying their fears, um, doing certain activities, which 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 would prepare them to 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 calm them and to prepare them for preparation for the academic, the teaching and learning. But the the return to happiness program really brings out that um, getting them to speak and share how they feel and how they felt, what they went through. This was very important. This is this was very important in the process. The same with teachers, um, that prior to the reopening of school sessions, we had special sessions like orientation and certain sessions with teachers prior to the reopening of school where the similar activities were done with them because the teachers did have their fears. Some of them fear of coming back to school, the, um, the cases are still high. And so we, we had this program where it was to deal with the psychosocial aspect. And upon um, returning to school, the counselors, the, the, the school counselors, the district counselors, they visited schools 
Um, they provided guidance classes. They went into the classrooms. They had sessions with the students, very active sessions where they had the children express and, and, and um, concerns and, and so on. And even in the online sessions, the counselors are playing their part going in because they have the guidance classes, especially at the secondary school level. In addition to that, there are some paraphernalia that were shared on, on in the, via the social media, which had videos and, and, and little um, motivational and inspirational um, guidelines, how coping skills for both parents as well, for the teachers and students. And at another level, at the ministry level, the, the decision in terms of the feeding program, because you have students who normally get fed at, at school and now they are at home and that's double dose for them. They, some of them may not have access, they don't have devices and so on. So to alleviate a little calmness with the, for the family, to put a little break on the family, there was the, the feeding program continued where packages were made, uh, placed, put together and sent home to the families of students who were on the feeding program. That's last earlier in last year and even in recent times we the, the ministry gave the, the 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 authorization for schools to cook meals for to the students within the small communities the rural communities so meals were being cooked as we speak daily and delivered some were delivered and some were um students were coming in depending on the the the, the community they come, whether how large or small or where they live. Um, another um, initiative from through the ministry where all counselors were given a telephone to deal with like referrals. So even whilst we were not at school, face to face, we do the referrals, but online it continued. So you had two referrals where teachers noticed certain things about students in their behavior or they lost a family as a result, a family member as a result of COVID or tragic circumstances. The counselors continue to play their part where they would have access to the family, access to the student to, to provide support for them. So these were some of them. And another, another one, we, we focus a lot on the student and the teachers, but we forget that the students are at home with the parents. And so in some communities, in some districts, we there were workshops for parents, because I'm telling you, some of the parents now see the value of school based on the comments because they are at home and they have to guide the students. So now they need some, some work, they need some support. How do I work with the, my child? My child is, is, is not, even some students, they don't listen to their parents. My teacher said, this is not how you do it. This is how you're supposed to do it. And mommy's saying this, you know, those little things. And I can speak from example because I have an eight year old. So I know. So the parents themselves do need that support. So little workshops were organized for parents as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Service. I believe we are, we are rounding up. So I will ask Mrs. Uh, Mussington Service one more question before we open the floor to question and answers. Uh, Mrs. Mussington Henry, what service, I'm sorry, what strategies are being used to cater to help students and teachers who were heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? And that question is to Mrs. Mussington Service. The schools on St. Martin have care teams, which include social workers, guidance counselors, and specialist teachers. The care teams reach out to students, parents, and teachers through special well-being e-magazines or newsletters. Teachers could have sessions with care team members. There was continuous monitoring of students at times using Google Forms, check-ins, even during the lockdown. There were also weekly check-ins with vulnerable staff members. If a teacher needed a day off to deal with their mental well-being, it was granted by some of the schools. Students were also given extension on assignments if they needed it. Referral to students to care teams in house counseling service, as well as referral to external agencies, such as the Student Support Services Division, is structurally available. 
Schools also had food assistance programs for students whereby they could get a voucher for groceries. And at one school, 100 plus families were invited for a Christmas lunch prepared by the teachers through donations from the business community. And this also helped in building relationships as well. Some schools also even assisted parents with, with money for rent. Families were connected with society resources for additional assistance. Zoom information sessions were held for parents and students. And what I also liked when I saw that schools also paired teachers with each other so that they can also check in on each other daily. And that was also very helpful for teachers. Students were also assisted with getting devices due to partnerships with business, the sector and community organizations. And some teachers were also assisted in securing a, a device. So those are some of the strategies that, um, that we employed here in St. Martin to assist those who were most severely affected. And I want, other thing I want to add as well, that those teachers with pre-existing conditions, even when the schools returned to physical buildings, those teachers were able to remain at home and teach from home as well. So there were considerations given as well for the health of our teachers and also those students who could not return. Ladies, I just want to thank you for your contribution to this session. I'm about to turn the session back over to Dr. Bristol for uh, the question and answer segments from the floor. But I just want to say that in listening to both of you on the two questions that I asked, I, I exhaled because 13 years ago when I wrote my dissertation on a phenomenology of distance learning, there was almost that sixth sense that I knew that this was going to eventually happen where we're going to be learning at distance. And this emergency caused by COVID and the, the transition to distance learning has put teachers in this novel decision-making situation. Uh, teachers, pedagogical decisions have an impact on the students' learning and experiences and how these decisions are reflected in teach the teaching process during distance learning is indeed critical. So, uh, you know, these can also make or break teachers, so teachers and students. So I just want to thank you both. and. Uh, Dr. Bristol, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you so much, Dr. Fletcher, Flax Archer. Uh, we, I just want to keep reminding our audience, don't forget, please jump right in. Let us hear your opinion and your voices via Slido, CSSI 2021. We've placed the information in the chat. Don't forget to go there and connect so that you can share your ideas. So ladies, we just have a few more questions that we wanna engage with coming from our audience. Uh, and to entertain as many questions as possible, I'll ask you to make your responses as succinct as needed um, without cheating us and sharing some of the exciting um, experiences. So our first question goes to you, Valerie, and I suspect we will take the same approach where Valerie will give a shot at answering it based upon the St. Lucian experience and Olga, you will give a shot based upon the St. Martin experience. So Valerie, you first, what do we need to reinforce the dual role you mentioned uh, that teachers now have? What should that support look like? Okay, the dual role, it's, it's it's very difficult. I think that teachers need more, more support in terms of resources. Um, the dual role as a teacher and, and as a parent, well, it's a matter of the teachers being able to get, be comfortable enough to, to, to provide timing, managing their time. In terms of the dual role where teachers are trained, being um, on the job training, well, training is important. The, the, the training is very, very critical because it improves the quality of teaching that the teacher would have to provide for the students online. And so there must be continuous training and there should be given time as well. The teacher should not be under unnecessary stress. So they should be given in a, um, time for training because what I did, um, the ministry provided training online. They, they, they provided online training 
and the, the teacher still had to do the teaching. But as a principal, what I did, I, I, I looked for those, the needs. I need to know the needs of my teachers. Those who, there were those who already tech, tech savvy. They took it and, 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 and ran with it. But then I, I need to know my teachers. And so I have to make special arrangement for those that need the training. And, and I have lots of um, success stories at my school as I speak, because, the teachers on their own decided that they, they, they wanted a day during the one week. I give them that day for them to come to the school together. They come with their devices and with, on a grade level, they teach, they learn how to ma maneuver the platforms and they, they learn from each other. So these were some of the things that can be done in, in regards to the dual role. Thank you for that, Valerie. Very important that there's a key role for the leadership here to be, I think we refer to it in the previous um, conversation, the agile thinker for the leader to provide that support for our teachers, given that we recognize that teachers already carry complex roles, but with the event of the COVID-19 pandemic, we now had teachers serving in two worlds at the same time simultaneously. So we had to, um, well, more than, more than two roles. In many cases, they were occupying three and four roles. Right. So we have to be agile thinkers as leaders as we think about how to mitigate these risks. So Olga, if it, would be, it would be nice if you can address some of those issues while attending to this question that is directly targeted at you. So Ms. Service, how do you ensure all these support services reach all teachers, knowing that they're occupying so many different roles and students, and it's hard to sustain them? What do you recommend? I would recommend that there be serious collaborations. It is, we are recognized at our, that there is not much funding to go around. And so we need to be very, very smart about how we utilize affordable funds and also how we are going to redirect funds from other areas because we cannot recover the economy without education. So we have to put in necessary funding in education, in the psychosocial aspects in order for us to provide the necessary support. So stakeholder consultations, coming together, the, find out what each other is doing and how can we now do that? If one school is doing something, how can we now bring that across exactly. to someone else? Right. Share, share ideas, maybe even share resources as well. So if there's a, a counselor doing something at a particular school, maybe that counselor can also include some others in another school. So we have to reach the point where we have to share resources, we have to share ideas, and we also have to do something about how we manage our funds as governments, as schools, and redirect funds to where the priority areas are. That is the only way for us to be able to sustain them. And also as we go forward, recognizing what we had to, on the goal last year, put certain certain structural things in place for us to be able to proceed as we go along. Thank you for that, Olga. You're speaking to a new form, a new kind of collaboration and cooperation between stakeholders, where education becomes everybody's business and not just the business of the school and teachers. So that's that's fantastic. Thank you. And we we hearing drumming that up. We're drumming that up in terms of the kinds of resourcing, not just money, because you're not just talking about money, you're talking about resourcing in terms of competencies and dispositions as well. Good. So we have another question that I think I would like both of you to address. So if you can think about your responses, what are the stakeholders? So we'll start with you, Valerie. What other stakeholders and opportunities may be more engaged to strengthen the psychosocial support at school level when there are disruptions to education? We face, fan, we face COVID, a public health crisis now. The potential is that, that in front of us is a very active hurricane season that is approaching us. So therefore, how do we do this? This. How do we uh, strengthen those existing systems of psychosocial support at the school level in case there is another disruption in the education system? Well, first of all, the Ministry of Health would be one of our main, from St. Lucia's standpoint, our main stakeholder to help provide support, especially the mental aspect. Um, they, they do have personnel within the ministry that provides like psychiatrists and psychologists and so on who can, who can provide the support to schools. 
You also have the, 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 the at the Ministry of Health le, um, level, we have nurses who visit schools on a, um, during the, the pandemic, where upon return, they, they visit the schools, they come and find out how things are going, how things, they check up on, on, on the visits daily and to find out how are we coping, they, they speak to the children and so on. We also have what you call the so human resource or social services. And that is a key, a key agent or key or stakeholder because as students, as we return and as we interact with the students, even online, we need to know that there are students who we need support. And when we talk about students, it extends to their families because the social services are there to provide not just the counseling and the, um, the support in terms of counseling, but support financially, because all of these go hand in hand as, as, as parents at home. You have homes where parents are, both parents have lost jobs, especially if they work in the tourist industry. And so this, it, the frustration and the anxiety and the depression filters from everybody within the household. So the social services need to play a key role in providing support for not just students, but for families, as well as the psychosocial aspect support is, is very important. And identifying those at-risk students, sometimes you have from certain levels of society, the socioeconomic status of certain homes. So the social services need to play a, a very critical part. In terms of, um, we have this in St. Lucia, we have what we call a school safety um, coordinator. And that's Mr. Kodron. He's one of um, in attendance there. He, his his role would, is critical as we re, if we as we return to school. He has to do a lot of visiting and to monitor and to ensure that the school's environment and everything is, is safe, following the guidelines that have been handed to us. And we have another important stakeholder, and that is the school attendance officer, because we do have students who have dropped out students we have not seen. And so he, their role is critical in going out there to finding those students and, 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 and getting them back on track. So these are some of the key stakeholders that we in St. Lucia would need to work with as, 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 as a community as we move along and are hoping that it doesn't worsen and it gets better. Thank you. Thanks for that, Valerie. I'll go jump right in. Yes, I would like to add to what was already said by Ms. Henry, that also service clubs, they can play a very important role in the process as well. And it will be important for them as well to not offer exactly the exact, the same thing, but to see how we can do different, what the needs are, and then what they can provide. The child protection services, we need them on board because as we know, the vulnerability of our students increased and the reports of abuse and neglect also increased. And so we need those um, child protection services on board to assist us in managing and providing support to those who are most vulnerable. The business community, consideration to parents so that they would have the time to necessarily deal with the issues at their schools and also maybe create some employee assistance programs as well. Because if the parents are not doing well, it will trickle down to the students, it will trickle down to the school level. And so we have to give consideration to the parents as well. The, min the Ministry of Labor, there are so many persons who are out of work and maybe there can be some trainings on financial management, budgeting, and different skills that can be honed by parents. And even for the technical institutions and the Ministry of Education to look at the issue of retraining so that parents can also be able to get skills in other areas. And so there are a lot of things that we can still do to assist because we have to look at the basic needs and, we, and, and then we can focus on psychosocial as well. Because if I am concerned about where my next meal is coming from, whether I would have a roof over my head, it's difficult for me to be able to focus on learning and what's happening in that classroom. Because stress brains definitely cannot learn. And so it takes an entire village and you will have to become that village once again in our respective islands. 
Thank you so much, ladies. Um, exceptionally good work as practitioners caring for the well being of our learners, of our teachers, and of our parents. Just to sum up some of the big ticket issues that you've raised, you've spoken about the dual role of teachers. And I suspect that we would begin, as we do the analysis, we'd recognize it's much more than a dual role. You know, we have taken on a quite complex arena of spaces that we occupy now as teachers in the COVID-19 pandemic reality. Something that you said very quickly and you and we moved on, but I think we would all be revisiting in, in short order. The whole question of adjusting the promotion criteria as a part of the psychosocial response, the importance of making the decision. Do we go, do we promote or do we um, have them repeat? And those questions I know are preoccupying the sector right now. The importance of the response targeting parents, teachers, uh, carers, all stakeholders within the ecosystem of the sector, and the importance of core teams, new forms of collaborations being um, developed. And I suspect that that one, these care teams that you've spoken to, I think it was Olga, I suspect that those uh, care teams would continue to be a practice that we will continue to take forward. So ladies, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, participants in the arena, please don't forget to send us your questions at Slido CSSI 2021. And we now turn our attention to the third round uh, of questions and conversations, which will now highlight navigating a widespread school population in Guyana. Our interviewer is Ms. Natasha McCarroll Ford, and she is a pro elementary school teacher who has been teaching for the past 28 years and currently holds the position of literacy coordinator at the Asha Stevens Hillside Christian School in St. Martin. And she's also the safety and emergency chairman of the school. Our practitioner is Dr. Marcel Hudson, who is currently serving as the chief education officer in the Ministry of Education in Guyana. Dr. Hudson has had an extensive career in education and actually recently published a book Born to Succeed, a collaborative approach to developing the God-given literacy potential of students in the early grades. So Natasha and Marcel, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Loret. Natasha, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Bristow. And good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Hudson. And once again, welcome to the forum. As Chief Education Officer covering the entire 83,000 square miles of Guyana, Dr. Hudson, what would you say are some of the underlying issues that were uncovered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? First of all, let me um, extend a special good afternoon to, to Dr. Lorette. Uh, to you, Natasha, and all the others on the call. And um, I'm happy to have been afforded the opportunity to uh, address this August gathering. And you're right, um, in Guyana, it's not as easy as, as, as some of our other presenters mentioned. We have approximately 163,000 learners that we, um, we have to take care of, and that's spread across 11 educational districts um, very wide ranging uh, in terms of distance. Um, the topography of the land is uh, in some of our regions can be harsh and, and therefore um, it's not easy, but we have discovered that we have never been really prepared um, at this level to meet the need and the needs of our students in, in the case of hmm or in the case of, of a pandemic. Um, we have students in the hinterland communities and the, those hinterland communities, there's no access to um, the internet and therefore we had to develop means and um, methods in order to reach all of our children and we have been doing a fairly good job at that. I, I want to say for in the inception, we have spent $1.5 billion in, in terms of um, worksheets, producing worksheets to keep our children engaged. And so um, Dr. Loret talked about the book, um, A Collaborative Approach, and uh, we've really seen the importance and the significance of parents, teachers, stakeholders working together because 
I believe that without that kind of approach, we would not make any kind of inroad. So, um, so collaboration was essential in order for us to actually meet the needs of, of our 173, 63,000 learners spread across 11 uh, education districts. So we, we were not prepared, we were taken by surprise, but um, as we go along, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer questions, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hudson, very creative indeed. My second question, how relevant was teaching, sorry, how relevant was technology in ensuring continuity of learning and what effective strategies did you implement in areas of low tech or no tech availability? Thank you for that. I think I mentioned initially um, we, where we hadn't any internet access, we actually produced worksheets. We've prepared what we call a consolidated curriculum and matched that curriculum with the worksheet so our children could be on par according to the different grades that they're in. And so um, we have discovered the importance and the significance of, of, of technology. Where we had the technology, we were able to develop what we call internet hubs. And we actually attempted to reach students wherever they are using hubs at QC, the insert unit, and um, some other persons actually, uh, we, we actually provided internet access to some teachers at their homes so that they could actually impact um, teaching and learning across the across the, particularly on the coast in the hinterland communities we had to um, travel miles and miles to take worksheets to have parents and teachers collaborate so um, our children could be impacted what we have done also you know having access to internet it's one thing training people to teach using the internet that's another thing and so I'm happy to report that since then we have trained over 4,000 persons in Guyana through Coursera. Um, that's um, using the Commonwealth um, of Learning and Profitero. We've had over 2,000 teachers trained how to use um, the, the, the internet platform, the various platforms to, to teach uh, in, in order to impact our, the lives of our students. So um, it came, I'm, I'm happy that Coursera, we, we, hadn't, we hadn't to spend it any large amount of money. We're grateful for the Commonwealth of Learning and also Profitero, um, we were able to, to easily have our teachers trained at, at three levels, basically um, using access to using the internet. And so they are much better now off in terms of using the internet because we've discovered it, it is not just, you know, uh, interacting with children, but you have to use the different, uh, you have to use the different modes. You have to know what you're doing. And so we have been able to have our children um, impacted in a positive way, particularly as it relates to the coast. Uh, like I said, again, in the hinterland region, we, have, we would not have had um, internet access in some of those regions. So what we did, we produced worksheets, but I'm happy to, to report also that the government of Guyana, we have since, since invested, we had one learning channel and that channel is situated um, it's situated at NSER, that's our curriculum unit. Um, since then, the government of Guyana, we have five, six other channels now positioned in the internet so our children could access lessons on the television um, by persons who, who would actually do live or recordings so our children could have access to, um, to teaching and learning. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. I must say you sound very pleased with, the, with your progress so far. <laughs> My next question would be, can you briefly describe one or two of your most successful approaches to addressing the challenges derived from the COVID-19 pandemic during the last year? I, I think um, what is important is our ability to mobilize. I think um, <laughs> I heard some of my previous presenters talk about, um, you have to think on your feet. I think um, the ability to mobilize, I think that that was important to, uh, get our teachers. We quickly called Zoom meetings. Um, we had teachers, parents, and uh, all stakeholders, thousands of them. And when I say thousands, six meetings, um, 500 people, 600 people, in some cases, the, the maximum of the Zoom that um, the Zoom could actually um, admit a thousand. We had, we had persons left out. But we all came together and we strategized what is it that we're going to do? 
to impact the lives of these children, how we are going to, to impact the lives of these children. So it could not have been a situation where the ministry decides that this is what you're going to do. This is what we're going to do. We obviously had to get the support of our teachers, the support of our parents to move this process forward. And I think um, we have discovered that together we could do the extraordinary. I think the dynamics of education um, has always been proffered years ago, but I, I think we be, we've begun to see the importance of collaboration. Um, education delivery cannot be reduced to, to one sector or one group of persons, but I think when persons come together with one agenda, we could have collective impact. And I think um, in, with regards to that, we have learned the significance of collaboration and cooperation and persons um, moving with one agenda. And I think that, that for me was very informative. We have moved forward now with the policy um, in, uh, in terms of, um, well, we have the, our safe school policy. What we are doing now is building in to that policy, the whole issue, because we've never looked at pandemic. We talked about floods, we talked about hurricanes, and so on. nobody focused on the pandemic. And so that has now been subsumed into, into, our, into our policy. And I think this is maybe what this whole forum is about, for us to think, um, for us to be futuristic and not think in the normal way, but we have to start thinking now about disasters in, in, in any form and every form. So we've gone in, in, in that direction. Um, that is quite true, I believe. Um, now it's time for us to really uh, uh, adopt the, the saying, education is everybody's business. You know, we cannot do this one person, one um, sector. It has to be everyone involved. And for my final question before we go to the q and Is there any strategy your country has implemented that will remain part of your educational system or your curriculum? And if yes, would you need to make any adjustments? One, we have come to recognize that we have to actually focus on the hinterland communities. And so it is against that background, we have started to establish smart classrooms in those communities. It, it comes at a tidy sum, but it has to be done because we are never gonna be taken by surprise again. And so in the hinterland communities, on the coast, we've already had some degree of success. In the hinterland communities, we, have, um, we will establish smart classrooms. We have started to put down learning channels in those um, using what we call resource centers where um, previously, they hadn't the technology. You know, sometimes we, we confine all the beauty to city life. And uh, sometimes we do not see the need um, for those in, 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 in the hinterland communities, the riverine communities, if I could say. And so what we have done, we have put down um, learning channels in those communities. So even if there's a pandemic, teaching and learning could still take place. We have also trained our teachers um, like I said earlier, we've also trained hundreds of teachers as to how to utilize the, 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 um, these facilities. What we've done also is given um, tablets um, to those children who may have been unfortunate, and we will always have those kinds of um, students. And so the, we have uh, worked with, uh, with the private sector, um, smartphones and tablets, and we have given to those persons. Um, what subgroups would have been established. Now, what I've discovered, um, some of us who didn't like the technology now realize how, <laughs> how critical the technology is. I have come to realize how, how critical the technology is. You, can you imagine you are meeting and, you know, as chief education officer, you know, we have this hierarchical structure. Um, you write a letter, the letter goes to the next force and the next force then it reaches. So we put everybody in a WhatsApp group. So everybody knows everything immediately. Um, so there is no question that the, bureau, the bureaucracies interfere with any process. So everybody knows everything. So we have a multiplicity of WhatsApp groups across the regions now, and persons are acting, reacting, and ideas are being shared, and it's amazing. Um, um, 
was teaching strategies, uh, being, uh, how we could treat with certain issues and so on. Even untrained teachers in some regions and some of those interland communities, we have persons, they may not have the qualification of a trained status, but they too have been exposed to, um, to training so they could be more, um, they could be more effective in, 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 in what they do. Uh, we have begun to live our, um, our, our motto, our old vision statement talks about eliminating illiteracy, modernizing education and strengthening tolerance. I think more than ever now, we, we understand the importance, not just of eliminating this uh, illiteracy, we've been working on that, but modernizing the sector and, and, and developing tolerance for people who have issues and so on to work with them. We've had teachers, I must admit that there's some teachers who are actually, actually afraid um, I really hope that some persons were not. I don't know what about my other colleagues who, who, who spoke, but um, I don't know if they found that some people probably, um, some persons were using this thing to their advantage too, and not actually um, coming out and really do what they, everybody spoke nicely about their people and stuff. I want to say that I am of the opinion that some people, they were using, um, the, because the, the crux of the matter is, you know, if you're in your house for a year and you're being paid, I think that's extremely nice. And so um, we had to, on some occasions, we had to caution some people about their, their behavior. Um, we, I'm, I have gone into communities and I would have written on blackboards. I, I got that from UNICEF. I think I saw some of you may have seen it too. And so we had, for it, particularly for the nursery children, we had persons blackboards or chalkboards set up in different communities and they were teachers who were going to put work there and marking those marking the work of those children on a daily basis they were parents who looked forward to that i could remember one day when the teacher did not go a student a secondary school student went ahead and put work on the board until that teacher would have arrived to put work on the board i could say we are moving a pace though in terms of how we want to go forward and uh, we are a little fortunate in Guyana in the sense that we are about to um, vaccinate. We're looking to have our, our, our teachers take the vaccine so that um, they could feel safe, they could feel secure going back. For now, we have, we have had a phase reopening. We have reopened the grades 10 and 11 because of the CXC, and we've opened the technical institutes. But I, I, I also had, a, um, for those of you who are afraid of, of, of the AstraZeneca, don't be afraid. I took it and I'm still, I, I took it like a week ago and I'm still going good. On the 8th of June, I'll be taking my second shot and I hope that COVID wouldn't bother me. I hope that COVID wouldn't bother me. But so we, we, we have to get our children back in the school system, the learning. For those of you who've been able to do so, I, I, I commend you. The learning, learning loss is not something that researchers tell us in a couple of years time, we'll see the impact of, of this. When we see people can't read, when we see people can't matriculate, they can't move on to high institutions of learning and we will see the manifestation. This why we, that is why we cannot take what we're doing now lightly. It's a serious matter. Thank you very much, Dr. Hudson. Quite informative. I am sure we all will be able to take away something here from your experiences and your strategies, your effective strategies. Um, I will now hand, take us over to Dr. Bristol for the Q&A section. Dr. Thank you Bristol. Very, thank you very much, Natasha. And of course, my, to my good friend, Dr. Hudson, thank you very much for sharing the experiences here. I think we share it in common. So we'd move now to the Q&A section and see what our participants are asking of us. So the first question is coming. We have oh, quite a few questions. Uh, using the worksheets and hubs, oh. to what extent do you think the quality of education can be at par with the regular classroom teaching? Are there any curricular considerations? I think I think the, the, this is my view as 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 a scholar. I don't think, um, and I could be wrong. I don't think there could be replacement for face to face interaction. And I've seen that because you actually get um, a close up look at, at at the teacher, and you, you actually get to interact you know, in a real way where um, you could see and the body language and see all of those things that you cannot see behind the screen and how persons. Um, um, would want to re re um, react in terms of the teaching and learning process. So um, I don't think the, the, what we, we are doing, it, I, I can't say it's on par, but I believe it, it, 
a good step. It's a step in the right direction. Um, we cannot uh, afford not to engage our students, even, even though we have not gone back into school fully. And so um, what we have done in terms of the curricula, we have done what we call a consolidated curriculum. We've had my room from Canada. They actually look at our curriculum and pull the curriculum into a, like 20 week slots so that our children could be integrally involved and will not lose the, the, the concept. The concepts were kind of consolidated. And I think it was better than just, um, than for us to throw our hands up in the air and say, we're waiting to go back into the school system or when COVID is over, because I don't think that we will ever go back the same way that we, we were before. Thanks for that. Have we evaluated the effectiveness of online learning to focus and to focus on attention issues, particularly ADD and ADHD age students? I, I, we, we have started to do um, some evaluation, but I could say that that evaluation right now, it is incomplete, but it is something that is in the works. We've had the Deputy Chief Education Officer Development and the Deputy Chief Education Officer Administration would have been um, attempting to do some work in that um, regards. This today, we've just completed what we call Education Systems Committee meeting. And uh, these very issues were, uh, were discussed. And so we're hoping shortly that we will have some kind of um, evaluation. So we could, because we wanna know that we want to still recognize that, that we are we are getting value for money because like i said how many dollars we spent on on whatever programs we had and so we have not completely done an evaluation in terms of the effectiveness but what we are seeing is a, a good response from our parents and the um, teachers who were saying that they are pleased with what is happening so far and that is anecdotal but i don't have like statistics to say look uh, 70 percent, 80 percent of the of, 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 of the curriculum has been effective and so on. That is something that we're working on. I think we've all been, we've never been this way before and we're all on a learning curve and so I don't want to um, to pretend or to boast about anything. Thank you for that. I think I think certainly the importance of the evaluation which will come after. So I'm hoping that all our education systems don't just go into the new normal when everybody is able to get back into classrooms, but actually yeah. take some time to really invest on that evaluation question. So our last question this evening coming from our audience, even with the setup of your tech centers for the hinterlands, what digital literacy challenges on the user side have you encountered and what must be done about them? Well, I, I think, um, like I said, we had we had teachers who did not know how to how to use the the equipment. They did not know how to use the various platforms, and so that was a challenge because our teachers they were accustomed to in the classroom, um, the face to face. The majority of them, the, the the vast majority, if I could say that, the majority, um, and so we moved towards Profitoro. This is a company that, um, that volunteered to do, um, to, to train our teachers using Google platform, the various platforms that are available. Um, uh, and then we moved to Coursera, um, which Dr. Lorette, you might be familiar with Coursera, um, where we, we, our teachers um, benefited from the use of the technology. And some of them were, they actually had a little graduation session for some of them because in, in our context, people want to know that whatever they do, it has some kind of value beyond, um, you know, beyond what is normal. So people wanted to know if they would have gotten points for promotion. They wanted to know if this thing, how valid this thing will be going forward and so on. So um, we had issues with people, you know, not understanding. Their teachers had to be called in for specialized training and so on because they still had to monitor. I must say some persons were afraid of the technology, but um, I think we're in a better place now going forward. Thanks for that, uh, Dr. Hudson. You've raised some very critical points as we try to sum up and move on to our next session. You've spoken about the importance of reaching our students and teachers where they are, developing site-based, culturally relevant responses to these realities, knowing that the provision for the urban student is not necessarily equal to the provision for the student in the hinterland or Riverina areas. Um, a good point of celebration for Guyana, over 4,000 teachers being trained um, in, in terms of being able to um, upskill 
uh, capacity development around digital uh, delivery, the importance of building uh, capacity building investments and partnerships, the ability to mobilize those partnerships, and of course, the importance of reducing the bureaucracy to speed up responses by using the same technology, which is very, very exciting when we think about the ways in which um, red tape sometimes gets in the way of our ability to respond in a timely manner. So that's a good takeaway practice, you know, the creation of a WhatsApp group amongst the different levels of leadership so that we can actually speed up our responses. And of course, another issue that's coming up that I know is going to confront us similarly with regards to the question of adjusting the promotion criteria. Another issue that we're going to have to keep in mind as we go forward, the importance of monitoring and assessing teachers and students learning on online and remotely. How do we do that? What are some of the best practices around that? So thank you very much, Dr. Hudson. It was interesting hearing of the stories and experiences of Guyana. Colleagues, we now turn our attention to round four. And this is our final round, uh, which explores the multi-hazard context in the Bahamas. Our interviewer is Ms. Gail Drakes, who works out of the Sidima Coordinating Unit, and she's currently serving as the Education and Training Specialist on secondment from the Government of Barbados. In this position, Ms. Drakes is responsible for the implementation of the Sidima Regional Training Center and for the overall education sector portfolio of the agency. We have two practitioners with us today, and we have first Ms. Benita Adderley, who is the School, and Safe, School Safety and National School Lunch Program Administrator for the Ministry of Education in the Bahamas. Ms. Adderley is a member of the American Association of Family and Consumer Science Education, Educators, the Association of for Career and Technical Education, the Caribbean Association of Home Economics, and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Ms. Sharmin Sinclair, who has over 30 years of experience in the education arena and is currently ser so, so, sorry, serving at both the primary at the primary level in the area of special education and as a monitoring and evaluation coordinator. Currently, Ms. Sinclair serves as the Assistant Director of Education with responsibility for planning and the research section. So uh, with that, uh, Ms. Gail Drakes, I hand over to both uh, Benita and Charmaine. We look forward to hearing the experiences. Thank you, Dr. Bristol. Uh, good afternoon to all, and especially to Ms. Sinclair and Ms. Adderley. Uh, first question. Um, how did the impacts of Hurricane Dorian in 2019 affect the education sector's response to the pandemic? Uh, particularly in the context of being in that post-Dorian recovery state uh, process. Uh, how did the experience better prepare you or prepare you in any way for the, the, the pandemic? The catastrophic effects of the passage of Hurricane Dorian saw the enhancement of public-private partnerships and the intergovernmental partnerships. Now, um, our disaster risk reduction coordinator represents the Ministry of Education on the Executive Council for the Bahamas Red Cross, as well as the National Emergency Management Agency. Now, this affords the organization seamless transition of information. So, these relationships that are, are, have been formed and have been um, enhanced afforded the Ministry of Education avenues to refocus and to prioritize new proposals and policies that would not only address current concerns, but in any crisis faced in the future. So as we, we met with other um, agencies, in particular, the Ministry of Health, especially dealing with the um, COVID-19 pandemic and um, environmental health, um, we still had uh, personnel on the ground in the form of physical plant who was still doing the evaluations of the um, Hurricane Dorian um, recovery efforts on those islands that would have been affected. Um, so that continued to go on and um, our partnerships basically we just, we just transitioned into another mode. And as we worked through both, we found that there was a need for us to develop um, additional policies. And that particular policy is this document it's called the Strategic Plan for Safe Reopening of Schools 2020. This document speaks to everything 
that um, you would need to know the phase learning uh, process that we are uh, engaged in. Um, it talks about the safety of um, schools, whether it's um, regular safety issues, whether it's a crisis, whether it's um, hurricane or otherwise. Um, we also have the safe school policy that um, was drafted prior to this. And, and um, some of the information was used to develop this particular document. So out of all of this, we found that um, as we met with our teams, we found that there was a need for us to create uh, what is known as a safety school committee. And so each school now has on its campus an officer that's responsible for the safety of the school that would deal with any matter, any risk, um, hurricane, um, God forbid, another pandemic, um, if there's a fire, whatever the emergency is, we have persons now um, on the ground that spearheads those um, teams on the school and then there are committees that are that were formed to assist uh, the coordinator of that. Even here at headquarters, we have identified individuals who would have um, done training and they are responsible in case of emergencies for each section. Um, Barring that, um, we would have continued our relationships with all of the international partners as well, not only um, the governmental ones, but the international partners that saw us through Dorian and is now continuing to work with us through the pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Adderley. Uh, Ms. Sinclair, um, if we could, the same question. But maybe you can also share a bit um, from your perspective. Yes, thank you, um, Ms. Drakes, and good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Bahamas and the Ministry of Education in particular, I just wanted to say um, thank you for having us here this afternoon to share our experiences. As we uh, faced Dorian in 2019, there was something that we had in place prior to Dorian in terms of developing a plan that would look at um, continuing education for our students in our far flung islands in the Bahamas. For those who are not aware, there are 700 islands in the Bahamas. 30 of those are um, mainly inhabited by citizens of the Bahamas. And on each of those islands, we would have schools. And oftentimes we'd find that we do not have the full cadre or complement of teachers for every one of the subjects for all of our programs to reach and to teach on each of those islands. So we had planned what we term a virtual learning network where we would have been able to teach those students on those far flung islands. Dorian occurred in 2019. And because we had that plan in place, we were able to quickly mobilize so that the two islands that were heavily impacted by Dorian and um, Abaco and Grand Bahama, where most of the schools were destroyed, we were able to get those students online and being taught from a virtual school. The pandemic hits now in 2020. And because we had the virtual school going, we were able to again mobilize the week after schools were closed for face-to-face -face instruction, we were able to now have virtual instruction. But what we also did was the director brought together a, a committee that he called the CRS 20. And this would have been made up of stakeholders, from not just education, but other sectors in our country, where we were able to put together a plan that would speak to three instructional models, despite the circumstance, despite what was happening in our country, three instructional models, face-to-face, -face, the hybrid, as well as the virtual, so that if anything were to occur, we would be able to quickly transition from one to the other. So at several points in the 2020 and even now 2021 school year, we have several things going on. We have some islands that were always in face-to-face -face when the country reopened. We had some islands where we were totally virtual and then some hybrid 
blended learning taking place on some of the other islands, depending on what the situation was and whether or not our health officials and the competent authority in the Bahamas said, close, open, you're able to go. And so we came up with what we would do for capacity building. Dr. Hudson spoke very eloquently to the training of teachers, but not just teachers, parents, because we had learned that lesson that we needed to be able to quickly communicate with parents. They are a key stakeholder. We needed them to be on board in terms of building their capacity. We had learned that lesson from Dorian. We also needed to know that there was infrastructure in place. So those who were going to go totally virtual, we had to work on infrastructure, devices, those persons who did not have electricity, we would have gotten help, as Ms. Adley said, from our international partners, as well as national partners. We had civil society and private sector that just jumped on board, supply devices. We got devices that were able to be solar um, powered. We were able to, as Dr. Um, Hudson um, indicated in Guyana, they worked with Profitura. We had had a relationship with Profitura prior to the pandemic. And so we were able to utilize what kinds of resources they had offered to us. And then there was dialogue policy that needed to be formulated, put in place. And we're still working on some draft policies, particularly as it relates to technology and then making decisions in terms of national sectoral agreements, international and then intersectoral agreements. So working with health, working with social services, coming to agreements nationally so that everyone is on the same page, everyone knowing um, what's happening. And one last thing I want to, to insert there for that first question in terms of, those schools that were in the different models. Dr. Hudson um, seemed to be doing a similar thing in Guyana. We came up with what we term a national pacing guide so that those who are in the face-to-face, -face, those who are in the virtual, those are in the hybrid, we would all know where a student should be in the curriculum at any given point in time everyone keeping pace according to what that guide said. So even when you transition from your face-to-face -to, -face to the hybrid or from your first face-to-face -to, -face to totally virtual, you would know where your student is. Parents would be aware because we've communicated with them. We've done some capacity building and the, continuing um, our, all of our professional development um, uh, activity because it has to be ongoing. There's nothing that says we will know everything all at once. So the impact of Dorian as a natural disaster, the impact of COVID-19 as a health or, or disaster or pandemic, we have learned lessons. We're still continuing to learn lessons. And this kind of forum, I must say, um, further enriches what should be taking place in terms of the networking. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Sinclair and Ms. Adderley. So just one more question um, following on from that one. Um, I'm sure that in the process, there also were, you, well, there were a number of challenges that you were over, working to overcome. So could you share one or two of the most effective practices from you've, had, you've found from managing multiple crises in a multi-island state such as the Bahamas? Um, particularly is in this example of the aftermath of a major hurricane and a, an ongoing pandemic crisis. Um, let me start with and the other way around this time now. Let me start with Miss Sinclair and then Miss Adderley. We, um, you can follow on immediately after. Thank you. Thank you. So we 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 faced many challenges. We still continue to face um, challenges, but. Uh, I would say two of our best practices. One, knowing exactly what our local resources are and where they are, as well as international resources and where, where they are. Uh, someone spoke about um, closing those, those learning gaps and, and knowing exactly where those students are. Um, we've had 
good dialogue, partnerships with that. So that for us, a good practice in terms of knowing those resources, being able to call upon those resources and knowing where the strengths are so that we're able to address things like those, those learning gaps. Um, the other is communication is always key. Uh, persons, all of our stakeholders need to know um, and continue to ask what is the policy for that strategic plan that Ms. Adley referred to in terms of um, the safe reopening of schools, knowing that there is a plan that we can refer to that because that has a framework to give guidance to how we should roll out, how should we proceed as we transition from one um, circumstance to the next, the strategic plan and having it available. So what we've done is we've posted that on the Ministry of Education's website. We have published hard copies and sent out to all of our key stakeholders. Um, but even before that was published, they had a say. So we would have had um, sessions where we had um, over 3,000 participants, parents, teachers, students, administrators, the unions, the community um, leaders, all a part of it so that they would have been able to feed into that plan. Now the plan is available to all. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Adderley, your thoughts. Sorry about that, having some technical difficulties. Um, my um, two things that I found um, that were really good. After Hurricane Dorian plummeted through the Bahamas, it left um, catastrophic devastation as we know. And Bahamians and residents were challenged with a myriad of issues. Um, housing, food, clothing, basic Maslow um, hierarchy of needs. And one of those would have been, in addition to that, would be loss of documents and psychological um, um, damage. The, the Ministry of Education, in collaboration with other intersectorial agencies, did this assistance program. Um, this was hosted over at the National um, Gymnasium, and it brought together a cross-section of governmental and non-governmental agencies. The objective here was to regularize the students and families misplaced um, from Hurricane Dorian as quickly as possible uh, in an effort to restore normalcy, well, some normalcy. Um, the exercise provided opportunities for families to be assessed by other agencies, including medical officers. So we did everything. It was kind of like a, a one-stop shop. You, we went from entity to entity to entity until you completed the entire cycle. Uh, the recipients were provided with vouchers for food, vouchers for uniform, because of course now they, a number of them had to be placed in New Providence or on a number of the other family islands that were not affected. So they were given um, these items. And as they completed their processes, they went through um, evaluations by Department of Social Services. Um, the police department was there to verify that the documents were lost. Then we had the defense force there. We had um, Bahamas Correctional Center there. Um, Ministry of Youth and Sports, of course, and the National Insurance Board. So there were so many other persons that were involved in that particular exercise. And um, that particular exercise really helped with the um, return to normalcy, about some, some normalcy, some form of normalcy for those um, persons who were uh, survivors of the Hurricane Dorian experience. And um, it also uh, afforded them the opportunity to register for school all in one location. So that was the first one. The other one that I liked um, in particular would have been the management of the human toll. We, we talked about it, um, two of the other speakers talked about it earlier. Um, here at the Ministry of Education, we have something called um, Employee Assistance Program. This unit is consisted of guidance counselors and um, together they worked with the special services unit, with, which consists of the school psychologist. And together they um, did a number of training sessions to work persons through the Dorian experience, all those suffering 
from PTSD to try to help them um, to deal with their circumstances, their loss, loss of family members, loss of, of, of physical attributes. And um, we also had some help from UNICEF and Israel Aid, both collaborated with the Ministry of Education and the EAP project. And this project, um, it was kind of, um, it was basically for children and it provided them with a happy place where they had um, toys, different aids and, and activities that will help them to kind of sort of creating a utopia that will give them something that will help them to remove themselves from all of the, the stress and the trauma of what they would have experienced and try to give them an opportunity for them to relax and be a child again. And so I, I like that. I really like that particular one. And the last one would be the uh, Bahamas Association, Association of Psychologists and the Ministry of Health at Sandilands. They continue to offer um, the spearheaded project um, program, sorry, to also assist with um, persons who would have experienced the Hurricane Dorian, um, oh, the, the, the RAS, sorry, of Hurricane Dorian and the trauma that it, it brought on. And so this, these here are activities that, that happened for Dorian, but as we moved into the COVID-19, the EAP of the Ministry of Education, along with the psychologists and the other agencies that were mentioned, the psychologists and the uh, mental health institution of the Bahamas, they continue to offer training sessions, um, how to handle um, life with COVID, um, managing stress, especially for our parents who who especially those ones who were from the um, hospitality industry who had no income coming in whatsoever because everything was shut down. So they worked with them. Um, and then, you know, you had to work with those persons quickly to um, prevent the, the spread of the um, committing of suicide because you, you start, people started to get suicidal here in the Bahamas. So, you, you, you know, you wanted to, to, to mitigate that before it became um, um, out of control. So, that was something that I liked. And I want to add one more thing, if, if I may. In the process of helping our students with COVID-19, the National School Lunch Program um, provided our students who were on the safety net program. We continued um, food allowance for them in the form of food vouchers. And we did three installments throughout the, the year 2020, um, from March 16th when school was closed down until June of 2020, we provided um, assistance for them and their families to continue um, receiving food vouchers. Okay, thank both. Thank you both for sharing the experience, um, your experiences there in the Bahamas and the lessons you've learned along the way, um, dealing with a, a huge multi-island state and the several crises at the same time. I am going to hand over to Dr. Bristol um, to take us into the Q&A. Once again, thank you both. Thank you, thank you, Gail. Um, and thank you to both Benita and Charmaine. Now we don't have a, a lot of time because you, we were so involved in, in sharing the experiences that you shared with us. So we actually don't have a lot of time to deal with the Q&A. So I'm gonna ask you to um, be rich but succinct as we respond to the questions that are being posted. So the first question, and I will direct that question to Charmaine, uh, everyone talked about technology, but what about other support systems? Example, electricity. Therefore, some of the institutions overhead costs were being reduced and transferred to teachers. In addition, power cuts and bandwidth issues are frequent problems. How, do, how did you all deal with those kinds of issues within the Bahamas? Right, so that was the importance of making sure that there were um, other sectors or agencies that were a part of the planning. Um, everyone being on the same page in terms of, yes, there are not, um, there isn't any electricity on these two islands. Um, this particular island has frequent power cuts. So knowing everyone knowing that and then speaking to how best to deal with, whether we needed to send some devices that would um, allow devices to be solar powered, whether we would use the instructional packages on those particular islands, 
whether or not um, we needed to do some other things. And also policy being a part of all of this in terms of knowing what the bandwidth issues would be, and then speaking to the national agency that deals with now that we're in this era, we need to ensure that there is a specific amount of bandwidth available to each person who is going to be a part of the teaching and learning process. So those kinds of um, things we would have done. Thanks for that, Charmin. So it's about coordinating your partnerships in a fundamentally different way so that we can actually ensure that there's equality of service across the, across the landscape. So Benita, we'll ask this question of you. Many good plans, and both you and Sharmin spoke to the fantastic plans that were developed, policies that were developed, put in action uh, in the Bahamas. And I think you're already seeing the impact of, of such design, particularly uh, that caution, quote unquote, national pacing guide. Uh, so many good plans are designed. Some are properly disseminated, few are read, and even less are remembered. A little bit skeptic. Um, how do we ensure plans can be effectively implemented? How do we ensure proper coordination within and across sectors? Okay, the first thing, um, if we're going to ensure that the plans are effective, we must have the buy-in of the stakeholders. That's the first thing. And once you have your stakeholders buy-in, not only um, private sector, but public sector as well, particularly your um, instructors, your administrators, your parents, your students. Once you have your stakeholder buy-in, it, it becomes so much easier for you to transition from one program to the next or one stage of a program to the next. Um, how do we ensure pro proper coordination? Um, there's a unit here in the Ministry of Education known as monitoring and evaluation. So you must make sure that we consistently monitor what is happening in the programs and then we have to evaluate and give feedback so that we know how to move forward or how to correct any inconsistencies that may be occurring. Thank you very much, Benita. I think, and I, I would want to say thanks to both you and Charmaine. Uh, you raised some important points for us to take home. Um, the importance of knowing what and where our local and international resources and partnerships were, the importance of data. Benita, you landed on that whole question of monitoring and evaluation and using that information to guide how we uh, coordinate the, the rollout of strategies and policies, the importance of stakeholder partnerships, uh, and and, and ownership, ownership of those partnerships by equally amongst um, the different persons and the importance of creating safe spaces for learners to escape and to reimagine and recover. Recover. It's very important for us to create those kinds of safe havens for our students. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly. And I, as I listened and, and I, to all the sharing that we had going on across the region, uh, I can say that what we need to do is congratulate ourselves. None of us were prepared for COVID. Um, men, few of us are prepared for hurricanes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we certainly got hit from left uh, with regards to the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic. But I think the Caribbean can do well as it relates to congratulating itself on how it was able to respond to provide for the needs of its learners in sometimes very constraining circumstances, recognizing that we were also all dealing with an economic crisis, which also curtailed our ability to respond. But we certainly developed very, very indigenous practices. So for that, we in the Caribbean need to congratulate ourselves and say job well done. Some take a Big ticket item, take a home, take away messages, the importance and the ability of the ability to mobilize and to be agile. Uh, the importance of reducing bureaucracy to speed up responses. Uh, the importance of supporting not just our students and not just our parents, but also and not just our students and not just our um, teachers, but also our parents and building the capacity of our parents to support us with providing for uh, the emergency and remote responses to ensure that our students didn't lose too much time and too much space. Um, we talked about ownership 
And the other issue that we all go dealing with now, and I can't overemphasize it enough, um, adjusting our promotion criteria. So we are now in a new landscape as we think about the recovery where we are using our data, we are collecting data, that monitoring and evaluation process so we can design uh, other response initiatives to close the gaps and ensure that the learning loss is not too significant. We know it's going to be significant, but to mitigate against the risk now against the learning loss as we continue to move forward. So colleagues and our participants in the wide world, uh, internationally and regionally, thank you very much for joining us for this opportunity to think about uh, some of these best practices that have obviously emerged within the region. We say thank you and we invite you to participate in the next session which takes place tomorrow morning. Thank you everyone.